database to to explore the relation between environmental factors and the disease. So the study population of my study is from Taiwan Biobank. The inclusion criteria is adequate data, of course. And the inclusion criteria, we exclude the people who has uh, who was were current smokers or ex smokers. When we uh, do when we do the secondhand smoke research, we need to exclude this kind of participants. We will focus just focus on the never smoker, and also we we exclude the page uh, the participants with underlying kidney stone disease because we are a longitudinal study and we need to know the new onset kidney stone disease. So the study outcome is a development, development or new onset kidney stone disease. So this is a flow chart of my study. This is a longitudinal study. And we exclude participants with underlying kidney stone disease and the current smoker or ex-smoker. Finally, there are 19,430 participants in our study. And we divided them into non-smoker and the smoker. Among us, uh, uh, non-smoke, non non-exposure and the exposure group, sorry. And the, among the exposure group, we divided them into less than 1.2 hours exposure per week and uh, more than 1.2 hours exposure per week. Why we choose 1.2? That's the median exposure time in our start, in our cohort. Here shows the result. The majority of subjects were female. That's reasonable because a lot of men who smoke were recruited from our study. So they are more female in our study. And the total of 92% subjects were in the no exposure group, which means 8% of subjects were in the exposure group. We could see this table. This is a baseline characteristic of exposure, uh, non exposure group and the exposure group. We could find some interesting things like in the exposure group, they, they have higher BMI, which means when you explore to secondhand smoke, maybe you will become fatter, uh, of more obesity, and uh, more higher prevalence of alcohol use, and the lower prevalence of physical activity. And because this is a longitudinal study, so the, uh, we have the median follow-up time. A, medium, a mean follow-up duration was about four years. So uh, in this table, we show the uni, univariate analysis. We could find that secondhand smoke exposure is significantly related to a higher incidence of kidney stone disease. The odds ratio is 1.69. When we adjusted for the confounders, we could find that secondhand smoke exposure is still related to a higher incidence of kidney stone disease. The odds ratio is 1.643. And uh, there is another very important risk factors for stone formation is the daily water intake. So we also adjusted for this factor, the confounder, and the, the results are similar. So secondhand smoke exposure is still related to a higher incidence of kidney stone disease. Next step, we will show that if there is dose response effect on secondhand smoke. So we divided the participant into three groups, and we could find that participant with less than 1.2 hours exposure per week. The odds ratio to have kidney stone disease is 1.4.
and the participant with more than 1.2 hours exposure per week, the odds ratio is 1.92. We could see a trend of increase. So this demonstrates the dose response effect of uh, secondhand smoke. So I think the smoking is not good to our health. And also for the non-smoker, they never smoke, smoke, but they will get the secondhand smoke from their partners, like from work or from home. So I think ban smoking is very important for every country. In Taiwan, the portion of secondhand smoke was 26% in 2008. And in 2009, we have a Tobacco Hazard Prevention Act to, stop, to forbid the, the smokers smoke in public area. So in our study, we are glad to find that the secondhand smoke exposure is just only 8% in our cohort. So I think this is very important. And my study is, is would like to tell, show the world Secondhand smoke is not only uh, harm for our like cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease, but also it will increase the incidence of kidney stone disease. So I think the 8% is not enough. It could be better. And the possible mechanism of the secondhand smoke and, uh, on the kidney stone, it may be come from the nicotine effect uh, to increase serum vessel pressing level and or increase the oxidative stress in the kidney or increase the serum cadmium level. All of these factors could uh, in increase the stone formation. The strength of our study is that this study is the first to demonstrate the possible influence of secondhand smoke on incident kidney, kidney disease. And we also show the dose response effects in our study. But we have some limitations. First, our, our data is from questionnaire, not from the medical records. And we lack of the information on dietary data, type of kidney stone, and we don't have the toxic chemicals in participants' blood, blood draw or urine and we don't have the subgroup of children or pregnant women. In conclusion, secondhand smoke is a risk factor for development of kidney stones. And the, this study is supported by the Research Center for Environmental Medicine, Cultural Medical University, and the Xiao Kang Hospital. And the, we hope we could have a free smoke environmental, like this picture, there is no smoke, blue sky, and a very good environment. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gen, for your very excellent and very interesting study. And you know, the study showed the non-smoke exposure, non, the second-hand smoke exposure will increase the risk of kidney stone disease. Very interesting. And we have a time for the question in the later time. So we have a 10 minute discussion later on. So we move to the next section by Professor Cai Yaozhou, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Cai from Taipei Surgery Hospital. Uh, today I'm going to uh, introduce our uh, second speaker, uh, Professor Sun Yong Zhu. Uh, Sun Yong Zhu is a well-known endoeurologist surgeon, and he also a very good friend of mine. And he was graduate, graduated from Seoul National University College of Medicine. And right now he's a professor of urology of uh, Seoul National University Hospital. And he's also the head of usability test center in Seoul National University Hospital. Uh, I believe this is his new job. And uh, uh, in fact, he's a very good uh, experience in endoscope surgery for kidney stone and ureter stone and also for prostate laser surgeries. Uh, today, uh, the talk he's going to give up is uh, assisted single man surgeon endoscopy combined intraminal surgery, uh, what we so-called ESERS. Uh, as we know, the ESERS is commonly performed by two surgeons, 
one is from the anti grade the other one from the retro grade approach uh, for for me uh, to perform uh, this kind of procedure with a uh, single surgeon is uh, quite magic uh, so uh, I think everyone is really interested in such a talk so that's welcome Dr. Cho thank you for your kind introduction and and I hope you are doing well and please stay healthy. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, today my talk is about, uh, I'm sorry, just I move to my uh, slide. And my, I'll talk about the details of combined intrarenal surgery regarding the roles of main and assistant surgeons. And it is based on the, uh, upon the matter of surgical efficiency, efficacy, and safety. As you know, the, it, the stone is very diverse. The shape, the size of urinary stone is so diverse and it depends on the complexity of kidney anatomy. We normally have to um, consider the upper, middle, lower, anterior, and posterior axis. And we can imagine a three-stored building with many windows. Now surgeons are uh, always challenging the quiz prior to surgery. How can you draw the linear lines to the uh, stone? Like a sniper uh, to hit the target linearly in a, in a linear direction, uh, through the windows in the building. We also have to consider uh, no building, no organ injury, uh, no uh, injury area either. And we can, uh, we can uh, make some linear uh, directions to approach the target to remove all the stones in a single session. But uh, as you can see the red uh, circle, there can be some remnant stones when we only consider the linear direction to the stones. And that's why we uh, are considering the combined approach of flexible uh, uh, device to the, the rigid uh, endoscope device. The kidneys and the renal stones are showing the many different complicated situations, including some examples in this slide. Uh, for the case of long callus neck, multiple tracks can be necessary and fluoroscopic puncture can be uh, helpful uh, to, to reach the stone. For diverticular stones, a single application of fluoroscopic or uh, ultrasonographic puncture can be feasible. The prone position, okay, it is a quite good option for the upper pole posterior diverticula but the situation can be a little different if it is the, the upper pole anterior diverticulum because we have to penetrate the upper pole parenchyma to reach there. And the, as you know, the risk of bleeding can be increasing and miniaturized nephroscope device uh, should be considered. Uh, you can see the obstruct retest with many stones in the lower uh, three figures. No fluoroscopic retrograde identification of the renal calluses is available, and the use of ultrasonography is mandatory in this case. So all, all, all these cases have to uh, under consideration for preparing combined approach, uh, but not simultaneous approach because we can put some priority, we can put some priority on the, the retrograde or integrate approach. This is my last. Uh, this is my case. Case last year, there was a, a, a big arena uh, pelvis stone and some additional fragments in the lower pole stone. My resident uh, performed a double J in dwelling one week prior to surgery, but the upper tip was uh, of the double J catheter was located in the upper ureter, not in the renal pelvis. Uh, the, my resident uh, wrote the operative code incompletely. And I couldn't guess the upper pole, uh, there was the presence of upper ureter structure. So when I performed RIRS first, because I can do this, I, th I think the, the renal pelvis on the size is just around uh, the middle size, one to two centimeter. And I thought um, RIRS can be feasible to remove all the stones in a single session. But when I performed the RIRS first, the ureter kinking was not so uh, good. And the final destination was just uh, anti-grade 
ultrasonographic puncture, the position change from uh, complete supine position to modified supine position. Uh, so for treatment of complicated uh, urinary calculi, I normally plan what type of surgery would be the first uh, initial option for my patients. So for smaller multiple stones, RIRS first. For big stones, a miniaturized PCNN and, and, and RIRS as the next option. But when should we consider bidirectional combined approach of anti-grade and retrograde? It may mean a, the initial bidirectional approach to the target or intraoperative conversion of the surgical methods. And it is important to surgeons and our assistants and our nurses as well. So we have to consider the surgical effic efficacy uh, uh, first, and, but there are many situ situations and we can choose a stone-free status, but we also consider a pain relieving or obstruction relieving or improve the improvement of renal function. So we cannot choose the stone-free rate on, as the only uh, uh, treatment goal in many cases. How about the surgical safety? We can first choose less complications. And sometimes we have to stop stone fragmentation if there's much bleeding through the percutaneous tract. And we have to remove the percutaneous tract and, and can leave some remnant stones. Then it may mean we can negotiate the best results considering patient safety. So, a basically combined approach can be used to remove the ipsilateral kidney stones and bilateral kidney stones. And for bilateral renal stones, combined approach can be the, the very good uh, case to improve efficacy and sa uh, efficiency uh, to remove the bilateral renal stones. And of course the target can include stones, but uh, the stricture or urethral tumor can be uh, other uh, targets as well. So as Dr. Ch Chia said, ESERS originally tried to represent combined simultaneous approach of anti-grade and retrograde uh, to remove the, the stones together by two surgeons. But so we can call this period at the era of combined surgery, but uh, we have to think efficacy, safety, and uh, efficiency as well. For big stones, PCNS shows better efficacy than RIRS with acceptable safety. But for small stones, I don't think the big uh, PCNS can show the good efficacy, but this, as we, the safety issues can be increased. So RIRS shows better efficacy, efficiency, and safety. And we, there are trinity of endoscopic surgery regarding uh, medical devices. So the first one is nephroscope or di uh, disposable devices. The second one is lithotrite. The third one is the irrigation because irrigation can influence the movement of the fragmented renal stones while we do the stone fragmentation. And uh, they are, can float in the irrigation fluid and it, it, it may affect the stone free rates. Not only the medical devices, we have to uh, consider medical staffs and the coordination of all these factors together. And it is about the cost effectiveness and efficiency. When you consider the urethral course and easy application of RIRS, I absolutely prefer supine position to prone because the in supine position direction to the UPJ junction, namely urethral orifice is quite a straight, urethral vesicle junction, I mean, but the ureter goes upward to the common iliac vessels and downward from this point. But in prone position, the ureter goes quite straight uh, compared to the supine position. The surgeons feel, uh, may feel difficulty to approach the ureter vesicle junction uh, at the initial period of uh, surgery. So we have to think of multiple options for patient's position, but okay, now, this, uh, I'll move on to the next topic because of the time limitation. So, I mean, uh, what, I, uh, what I wanted to talk is uh, talk about the position, uh, position is that uh, uh, we have to think that the quick uh, position change and the movement of devices and OR for efficiency while we 
uh, uh, consider the combined approach and uh, initial when uh, when we uh, choose the, uh, the a single uh, treatment modality, uh, for example, such as RIRR, so mini PCNL. But the case is uh, is different from my expectations. Then we have to choose the position change. We have to quick uh, movement of the, all the devices and uh, this uh, arrangement in the OR. So. Yeah, first of all, the bile, for bilateral cases, there is no controversy because if the stone size is big in it's the letter and the other uh, stone size is, uh, is not so big in the contralateral side, they combine the approach and simultaneous approach can uh, uh, have some absolute advantage uh, to handle the bilateral venous stones with, uh, uh, regarding this efficacy, uh, safety and uh, efficiency. But uh, if the stone, uh, the stone is not uh, quite different from this uh, situation, just we can just consider the, the uh, we can ch consider and choose only one a uh, single uh, treatment modality uh, to remove the stones first. But just we can uh, just prepare some unexpected situations in the in the OR. So we always prepare the this many devices. We can the de uh, prepare many devices uh, for a single uh, uh, surgeon and uh, in the surgery in the operating room. And yeah, actually I have to agree this, agree to this uh, opinion uh, the, the, as the disadvantage of combined approach. So if the surgery is focused on the main surgeon, just, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, basically, we, uh, we cannot deny the problem of the large number of devices for combined approach. But if the, the, the main uh, procedure is focused on the main surgeon and this uh, assistant uh, can help and to facilitate the main surgeon's surgery, then just we can increase, we can uh, increase the efficiency of surgery as well. So... If you use the uh, split uh, split the screen of the uh, surgical monitor, just then if the, the, the main surgeons can do perform the, the main surgery very efficiently efficiently, and if they if it can prepare some additional small monitor for disposable URS, then the assistant can do their own procedure as well. For for, for example, for the contralateral renal stones. So, uh, I I. Because I want to talk about the roles of assistant uh, uh, urologist, now I would want to describe each step of the combined approach to a complicated renal stone. In the flank side, percutaneous puncture, insertion of a disposable devices or metallic sheath, lithotripsy, and another puncture or flexible ancillary procedure uh, can be considered if it is necessary. In the leg side of the assistant uh, urologist, Guide wire, urethral catheter insertion, urethral exercises, manual or dependent irrigation, RIRS, systole lithotripsy, and RIRS in the country lateral side, we can see. So I organized them in the order of time. So if the second surgeon is not an expert, we have to find the most efficient way of performing combined surgery. Red color tags mean. Uh, the procedures for an expert, and the rest of them can be applied to an expert and a beginner together. The time for lithotripsy is valuable to our residents or the fellows because they can sleep during this time and it becomes sweeter to them when the stone is large. If the second sur the surgeon is an expert, we don't need to worry about the, the conflicting uh, of the time when the main surgeon does uh, do the, another puncture or the ancillary procedure, and the second surgeon uh, does the RIRS, systole lithotripsy, BPA surgery, the RIRS in the control level side. If the second surgeon is a beginner or a resident, the main surgeon has to move to the leg side after he or she finishes the main procedures in the flank side. Now, so we can calculate the loss of time when the second surgeon is a beginner or a resident. It is just a matter of 20 minutes or so.
So two experts in a single surgery can be a matter of efficiency, but I think the two experts in two operating rooms are better than two experts in a single operating room regarding the, the salary or the manpower and the, device, the number of devices and, and, and etc. So what should we consider for a surgical efficiency then? There are many uh, different uh, situations and we just, we, I, I am trying to uh, show some uh, uh, similarities and differences across the, the, the treatment modalities, including staged RIRS, PCNL, ESERS, or assistant uh, 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 single surgeon uh, combined uh, surgery uh, in this table. And just, I think the, the, when we consider the cost effectiveness and efficiency of, to remove the big size stones or complicated renal stones uh, regarding these treatment modalities, I think the, the uh, single surgeon assisted uh, combined approach, it can be the most efficient way and cost effective way to our uh, real practice in our uh, hospitals. So there is uh, recently Korean people are waiting for the new presidential election on March uh, 2020. So we have maybe we have to choose one of the treatment options, the RIR, stage RIR, SPCNL, uh, simultaneous uh, ESERS and um, a single surgeon uh, ESERS combined approach. So technology enables us to make our operating room compact and efficient as well. And it, it, it will happen if combined approach is necessary to improve our surgical outcomes and efficiency as well. Two lithotripters with different type machines can, uh, can uh, get enter into our operating room. And CRM ultrasonography or monitors can be merged into a more efficient device such as portable ultrasonography or smart glass system. Many companies are still developing RIRS and it will enhance the efficiency, surgical efficiency of, um, of combined intravenous surgery. So I expect the launch of new Korean brand robotic RIR system with high durability in the near future and high performance of new generation homium and gluon fibrillation we can see soon a newly launched disposable flexible URS system with affordable prices will enhance the surgical efficiency as well for main surgeons and assistant uh, surgeons as well. Regarding the electricity of homeum and thulium laser, fiber lasers, if the surgical fragmentation efficiency is the same, electricity in my humble opinion shows absolute priority of thulium fiber laser or homeum uh, laser when we consider the combined intravenous surgery. Smart glass can show a merged unified visual system just in front of the surgeon's arm. We can, we can wear the glasses just in front of our, uh, um, the, the eyes. And we don't need to find the CR monitor. So we don't need to yell, where is the CR monitor? Please remove the machine just in front of the CR machine. Uh, like this. So we don't need to find the CR monitor, camera monitor, ultrasonography monitor behind other machines or the surgical table. Surgeons may feel comfortable with this device during the whole procedure of combined approach. And of course we can see some other uh, fields of the smart glass as well. So we can see the assistants and what the assistants are doing. This is. Yeah, this the right side. This is the new president of Dong Sobi, a group of close Korean stone investigators. And he is wearing a, the, 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 the big size of smart glass. But yeah, in, in my case, just I can I, I, I am wearing a small size a smart glass. So there are some several different types of smart glass and we can choose one of them for our stone surgery in the near future. We are testing a new Korean brand robotic RIRS machine and we are performing simulator test, animal test, usability test, and clinical trial uh, sequentially. And they just more than half of the patients are, are, are already collected for this clinical trial. And with this new machine, we can see a very small pulsatile 
arterial pulsation, the movement of the mucosa during RIRS through the monitor, just, to, just in front of the surgeon. And now just I am sitting just in front of the machine and monitor and we can see the very detailed and, uh, information uh, in the calicil structure. A possibility of a microbody is also being introduced and it, it can bite the stones and dissolve automatically. And, and I think it is quite amazing if it really happens in the near future. So just my take home message is just if the, if the direction to the sequential combined approach is right, then just maybe the, the, the many uh, complicated or many number of medical devices can be problematic, but tech, uh, not technology in, uh, will enable us to uh, increase the, the uh, efficiency and the, the, we can use the, uh, can use the operating room more compactly than now. So I think that we have to prepare our future in the field of surgery, stone surgery uh, with the, the new technology machine and just we can consider many things in the many, many, we can consider many things and they will happen in the near future. Thank you for your uh, attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cho. Uh, a very nice uh, presentation of the ESA's technology. And because of your very informative lecture, we find very several uh, uh, interesting uh, new technology for uh, ESA's uh, for stone treatment. Uh, I believe a lot of people have a uh, question about this uh, normal technologies. And for me, uh, I'm very interested in the smart grass. I believe it's kind of augmented reality instrument, right? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, because of time is limited, we have to move to the panel discussion session. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, please. Uh... Professor Tsai, you can begin your panel discussion. Okay. Uh, uh, first, I have a question for Dr. Cho. Uh, uh, as you show in your uh, previous slide, uh, we find that uh, ESOS could be uh, a good solution for the uh, complicated stone, such as Casio WQS stone. Yeah. Uh, as we know, the calcium dimension is a uh, very challenging stone for breastbone urethroscopy. Uh, even in uh, multi in miniscope uh, PCL, uh, it still have a uh, low uh, stone free rate. Uh, so, uh, do you think the ESAs have some role in uh, this kind of stones, uh, especially complicated uh, calcium dimension stones, uh, which is really difficult to approach in uh, and the uh, retrograde uh, fashion. Well, as the, the renal anatomy shows, the, the is complexity of the, the distribution of renal stone, uh, when you consider it, the uh, distri complex distribution, then just flexible devices is, is absolutely uh, needed to reach all the calyxes and all the stones. The, but the linear direction of percutaneous approach can have limitations to reach all the spaces in the kidney. And just prone type or, or supine type with flexible nephroscope or flexible ureteroscope, we can choose one of the, the options. Uh, this across many treatment modalities. But flex, uh, my opinion is that flexible device is absolutely necessary in any case. And for example, Brian Eisner in Harvard University, he always do the flexible URS or flexible nephroscope at the end of the procedure. Even we cannot see any particles or stone fragmentations because the small fragmentation can float uh, to anywhere in the kidneys and they can, uh, they can place in any other place, uh, a callus, I mean. And, uh, and this uh, the linear type of uh, uh, nephroscope cannot see this small particle in other in another calyx. So, but of course, almost, in almost all cases, the flexible uh, URS cannot find any small uh, fragment stones, but 
just already many urologists, the success rate of stone surgery in many uh, centers are already uh, over than 80% or 90%. And if the if we use the flexible URS, and we just flexible URS, then it just we can increase the surgical outcomes into over the 90%. And I think the surgeon, uh, for, this is very important for all surgeons. But just uh, the 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 learning curve of flexible URS is, is quite, yeah, a, a, acute. And it just if if we have two um, experts for handling a flexible retroscopy, then just we can have two experts. But if if I am the manager of the hospital, if we have two uh, experts of flexible retroscopy, I let them go into the different operating rooms to perform the two uh, flexible retroscopy surgery. But just I am working for a, a teaching hospital with the assistants and residents and fellows. We have to teach them. And just we have to show some many tips and tricks to while we do the uh, perform the surgery. So any simulators or any uh, virtual reality or some other uh, training, hands-on training, cannot give the many treatment uh, surgical techniques to the assistants. And... I think the, the more and more technology, more and more devices are introducing to our surgery, and they can help the, the, to increase the, uh, to facilitate the, the efficiency of surgery to the main surgeon. And actually, the role of uh, assistance can be decreasing, and it is a matter of time. Uh, just that's why we are, that's why I'm talking about the assisted single surgeon uh, combined intravenous surgery. Thank you for the good question. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, personally, uh, as you know, we have a talk in, uh, uh in previous, uh, uh, all set, uh, several years in Korea. Uh, and, and my talk is, uh, clinical experience surgery for upper tract urethral cancer. Uh, as we know, uh, we come and do this with, uh, uh, ritual grade, uh, fraction. But, uh, as we know, we, some surgeons have very good experience in clinical treatment of the, after you see uh, through, uh, through the nephrostomy tract. Uh, although the risk of, uh, of tumors is very low for low risk tumors, uh, I believe this is still a viable option for kidney sparing surgery. Uh, uh, because the power of the ESAs, uh, do you think the ESAs have some role in uh, after you uh, see uh, as, as, uh, as with uh, modern technology? What's the possible advantage and then what are the possible disadvantages? Thank you. I think Dr. Che is a real expert for this issue. So I, but can I answer to this question in front of Dr. Che? <laughs> Maybe I, I, I'm asking your opinion first, but actually I had a case of a, the, the um, occurrence of a uh, recurred tumor after uh, my uh, flexible ureteroscopic surgery for UTOC, and actually it is uh, spread it to other organs one year later. So I think the low risk. Uh, I, I think the my humble opinion, just in front of the Dr. Che. So I think the low risk, uh, the differentiation of low risk UTOC is the most important one, and the close follow up is very. Uh, uh, necessary and uh, not to uh, lose our patients with UTOC and there is always uh, we have to remember keep in mind the, the risk of development of UTOC uh, to high grade or just it can distribute to other organs very rapidly so just we have to check it uh, 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 very shortly after the surgery as well and Olivia Trexel or some other guys with guideline, guidelines recommend a three month later checkup of CT scan uh, after the flexible retroscopic surgery, but some experts are recommending it just very short. For example, one month uh, CT checkup after flexible retroscopy surgery is helpful to uh, not to lose the patients with UTC. So, but just I want to ask your uh, opinion about this question. Just this is my humble opinion. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 actually, we have a, 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 a large call of Taiwanese pe people with mm -hmm. upper UC. So right now we are trying to build the, to build the uh, prediction model of the 
uh, high risk or low risk tumors so that we can uh, predict the patient's status before we go for the Kingspan surgery and also minimize the risk of uh, disease progression, uh, even mass. So uh, I think it's a very important work we are trying to do right now. And uh, I, actually, I have another question for the uh, first uh, speaker, Dr. Gun. Uh, and, uh, are you there? Yeah, Sorry? He, yeah he's okay. here. Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, I, I would like to congratulate you uh, uh, success in predict, uh, in finding the uh, secondhand smoke as the uh, risk factor of uh, renal stone. But uh, as we know, uh, those people in Taiwan who had uh, had the capacity to expose to the secondhand smoke, uh, this patient will come in uh, or low social economic status. Uh, as we know, this patient has also a uh, 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 worse uh, 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 health status. So how you uh, you know how do you adjust or or prevent the, the, the possible possible bias of this situation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a very very good question. So uh, in our study, I'm not sure here, but we. We do have this information about like income and the, the education status. So uh, I'm not sure here, but when we do the multivariable analysis, we adjust it for these factors. So the secondhand smoke exposure is still significant related to the incidence of kidney stone disease. And also, I I am not very quite sure. Uh, the the education status it's indeed related to kidney stone disease too. But we adjusted for all of them, and the so I think all these factors are independent risk factor for kidney stone disease. Thank you, you are Lisa. This is a very good question. I have a question. I'm Hyungjun Kim from Korea. And I have a question to Dr. Gang, if I uh, pronounce it correctly. Uh, thank you for your uh, great talk. It's a very interesting topic there. And I wanted to ask you about, you excluded in your study the uh, first hand smoker, right? And would there be any comparative uh, data between the first hand smoker and the second hand smoker? Uh, regarding the uh, kidney stone prevalence, or what do you think about that? And another issue is that uh, there are some papers that shows uh, the effect of caffeine and that it reduces the stone formation. And I, I'm, not, I'm aware, aware that uh, the Taiwanese have a lot of tea consumption. And do you have any thoughts on how it would affect the renal stone formation in that cases? Thank you. This is another very good question. There are two questions here, and I answer the first one. Uh, I seen when I review the articles, the first hand smoke and the second hand smoke, they inhale, inhale the similar compounds. About 80% of the compound is similar, are similar. So I seen the prevalence of kidney stone disease the inference of first-hand smoke and second-hand smoke, they are similar. But I'm not doing the analysis in my cohort because uh, as I showed before, we just choose the non-smoker. But I think this is a really very interesting question. Maybe that's my next paper. I will compare the first-hand smoke and the second-hand smoke and how's the prevalence. They are the same or difference. Maybe we could we could find the answer later, one year later. And then the second question is caffeine. So I see in Taiwan Biobank, they have the information of cafe, caffeine or other uh, sub -sub substance use. But actually, I, I don't do this analysis too. So maybe that's my next, next paper. <laughs> I could check the other substance like caffeine, like tea. But, but actually, I try tea. 
I tried the green tea, oolong tea, a lot of tea, but I cannot find any significant difference. The, there, there's no significance. So like tea, I, I remember. So I don't, I cannot publish the paper because there's no <laughs> significant difference. But I think this is another very good question. I could go back to check this and maybe uh, two years later or one year later, <laughs> you could find the, the paper. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Don't forget that Dr. Kim is an uh, idea bank in Korea as well. <laughs> Uh, actually, we, uh, actually, we have a question from online. Uh, one question is for Dr. Cho. Uh, uh, he's asking about whether ESAS is more cost effective than the conventional PCL for large stone, large renal stone greater than two centimeter. Uh, can Dr. Cho uh, reply this question? So that ESAS is that is it cost effective? Uh, uh, well, just if we can remove all the stones uh, in a single session with conventional PCNL, it just the the, the issues would not be cost effective. But if we remove the the uh, if we handle the complicated renal stones with uh, issues, uh, and if we can increase the single time success rate. Then just I think the, the issues can be cost effective, and uh, it depends on the uh, situations. And just I don't recommend we don't need to prepare uh, issues, you know, at at all times. So we have to choose some cases, and if it, and there can be some discrepancy from my our expectations to the reality, then just uh, the quick movement or all quick position change is necessary and just my uh, uh, opinion is my message is that we have to uh, move uh, to another position or quickly or we can prepare the the the, the machines as soon as possible to to uh, continue the surgery uh, in an efficient way so just to compare the ESAS and conventional PCNL regarding efficiency, just it can it can it covers many topics to discuss. Thank you for the good question. Uh, yeah, uh, another. I believe we have still uh, some time. Another interesting question is from uh, uh, Dr. Kapui. Uh, he said, in the future, do you think that you can invent a micro, uh, microchip, I, I don't know, in order to damage your stone? <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you think yeah, it's possible? <laughs> uh, interesting topic about microboard or because yeah. micro robot is, is trying to treat something in the, the vessels now, not for the stones yet. And it may it may mean we the, the we have already some good technology to make some a small robots to handle some disease in our bodies, but just it is trying to do something in the vessels. And if it, it is successful, then we can see some microbots in for the stones in the near future. But I think it the market it, it market matters. So. I'm not sure whether this technology can be converted to the, the stone world. So I hope so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, because it's time is uh, is is out. Uh, we have to uh, close this session. We'd like to thanks to all the speakers and all the moderators right here. Uh, thanks for your joining this meeting. And we have some questions uh, not replied yet, but maybe we will reply later online. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. See thank you next you. time. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, we begin to uh, another next uh, Vietnam section. Please, uh, Professor Tao. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, uh, the chairman. Uh, uh, thank you. Your, thank you, the sponsor. Uh, we, are, we come from uh, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City. Vietnam. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Luong Nguyen. Yeah. 
He is uh, the head of uh, urology in uh, Bình Dân Hospital, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. He is the uh, he graduate master of uh, general surgery, faculty of uh, urology, Ho Chi Minh University of Medicine and Pharmacy. We have certificate of advanced laparoscopic and endoscopy and all urology of Bình Dân Hospital. They are training course okay. of endo-urology technique of flexible retrograph in trarino surgery, Subai, Bicinel, and Halep in Boreme Hospital, Sir National University Hospital. He has many research of uh, treatment of muscle invasive bladder cancer and non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Today, his topic is the, the evaluation of the result of Tulum Yap laser transurethral resection of non muscle invasive bladder cancer combined with intravascular mitomycin C. Please. Okay. Hello, everyone, I would like to introduce myself. I am Dr. Lu Ming and I come from Vincent Hospital in Vietnam. I'm here to discuss about unlocked resection TAG1 bladder tumors using tulium laser. In other words, I'm here to tell you how the result and possible complications of transurero resection by tulium laser when we operate the patient with TAG1 bladder tumor, also known as non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. My presentation will focus on four contents, including the first epidemiology, the second classification and sizing systems, the third outlines of treatment for T. AT1 black the tumor. Finally, the results and complication. As you know, black the cancer is the seventh most commonly diagnosed cancer in the mouth population worldwide. The worldwide is on the slide incident price 945 for men and 244 for women. Approximately 75% of patients with black cancer present with a disease confined to the mucosa, say TH and CIS or submucosa, say G1. In younger patients under 40 years old, this percentage is even higher classification and staging system. You can see papillary tumor confined to the mucosa and invading the lamina rodea are classified as say TA and T1, respectively according to TNM classification system. Plus high-rise tumors confined to the mucosa are classified as CIS or CIS. All of them can be treated by transurero resection of the bladder and then combined with intravesical chemotherapy. This is TNM classification system of European Association of Urology, TA, TIS, or CIS, T1. All of them are also known as non muscle invasive bladder cancer. So you can see the, this a typical picture of TCC sub bladder tumors. The goals of transurero resection of black tumor or TURBT to make the correct diagnosis and 
completely remove all visible lesson, the operative step necessary to achieve successful TURBT includes identifying the factors required to assign disease risk, such as numbers of tumors, size, characteristics, the ration of CRS, recurrent versus primary tumor. Clinical space, adequacies of the recession or visually complete recession. Finally, ration of complication. To measure the size of the longest tumor, one can use the end of cutting loop, which approximately one centimeter wide as a reference. The characteristics of the tumor are described set style, yes or no, nor do the fulfillery of large. It is necessary to consider combination with intravascular chemotherapy in on patient. So the forms of energy Okay, Professor Cho, uh, the doctor, the doctor uh, Luan already finished his uh, video. Yeah, next slide. Next, next one. Okay. Okay, here is the next topic. Next slide of Dr. Lung Wing. Can Okay, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Could you wait a moment? So, uh, Dr. Luen, do you want to yeah. play your slides? Yeah. Okay. Yes. You can uh, share share the next slide after the video. Okay. Yeah. 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 So do you want to share your slide? Where is oh, okay? Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, I continue. Oh, okay, everyone. I continue with uh, my topic. Uh, the form of energy you see TURBT, including monofolar, bipolar, forwards, and laser. Compared to uh, monofolar recession, uh, bipolar recession has been introduced to reduce the risk of um, complication such as uh, black nerve perforation due to uh, obstructive nerve relax and to reduce back the sentiment. Uh, so how about lasers? This is a relatively new method which applies in uh, Russian years. Uh, so uh, 
the application of laser GUIBT has many advances over classical methods such as uh, do not stimulate of um, uh, observation improve hemostasis, less pain than use uh, monopolar anurase, reduce harm of um, ureteral capillary relation uh, using the solid solution, no hospital should avoid transurial recession syndrome. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, this picture is uh, regulates laser machines and tools you that being in hospital. Uh, so how about sodium laser power? Uh, the more recent romance developed of laser in the introduction of thorium. Uh, it has a uh, approximate uh, two micrometer continuous ways close to the water balance. A form of uh, energy is transferred by optical fiber from the transmitter to the circular side. Oh, so, uh, and lovely session techniques. This year, uh, overview feature of and lovely session techniques for black tumor. As you know, it requires recessing to the black muscle layer. Oh, uh, so, uh, uh, here is a uh, video about an obstruction black tumor mass at Vincent Hospital using regular laser machine. Uh, this is a uh, black the tumor about two centimeters in the black wall. And uh, you can see a uh, video. Oh, so uh, in terms of the result and complication, the studies was conducted during the Florida's from 2014 to 2019 on 68 patients at Vincent Hospital with the 81 black cancer on patients under one TURBT using Tulium laser. Of the 16 and patients, uh, among men accounted for 79% and uh, women accounted for 
21%. Means I about 50 even for straight years old. Uh, mean tumor size about 19.2 millimeter. Means number of tumor about uh, 1.8 tumors. Uh, mean angel operative for us uh, about uh, 247 minutes. Operational relax euros, less the perforation zero, serious uh, bleeding zero, first stop reduce, less the infusion only 2K. Euros uh, considerations about once for nine days. You can see uh, uh, using Trillium laser forward compared to monopolar forward like the other season uh, and or zoo has a significant improvement in nerve blast, uh, black the perforation and first properties of black the infusion, uh, such as nerve blast 18 times for or um, seven times versus euros, black the perforation four case or three case versus euros. Uh, first of the uh, for, sorry, first operative black infusion, uh, 11 case or 41 case versus only two case. Uh, seen then significantly reduced days of um, urethral catheterization and hospital space. Uh, so, in contrast, using Trillium laser forward compared to Last my kinesis like the also Russo or Sishunan has no difference in uh, uh, such uh, significance about complications. In other words, uh, there was uh, equally sized. Therefore, based on urinal catheterization and hospital size of um, the studies are uh, equivalent. In regard to uh, complications, first of the two black the infusion has two cases account for uh, 2.9%. Urinary tract infection has four cases account for uh, 5.9%. Urinary stricture detected after three months, uh, only one case makes up 1.5%. All of them will uh, follow us every three months for first three years and uh, every six months for years later. The recurrence rates of um, study sample were uh, 14.7% to apply the Kaplan measures uh, methods to estimate the recurrent free survival times of patients after surgery about uh, 30. Once for two months, which be less than zero point zero five. In conclusion, uh, the uh, application the URBT using Trillium laser to operate non muscle invasive black lung cancer initially so uh, the feasibility, safety, and easy to perform, high ability to completely remove the uh, tumor for the first time with low complication. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation of uh, Dr. Lung Nguyen. We all know that in the literature, more than, yes. more than 400,000 new case blood cancer diagnosed worldwide per year. This represents a uh, whom oncology and economy burden. Around 75 to 80 of these patients have no more invasive that the cancer representation. Okay, the we... Start, yeah, the start of care of no more invasive in uh, diagnosis in treatment, complex trans uh, transuridal recession. Uh, many various energy 
apply it for treatment of normal cell invasive bladder cancer. So we will come back and uh, discuss of uh, uh, tulium laser in normal cell uh, invasive bladder cancer. The next presentation is up. The next presentation uh, is of Dr. Hong Chang. Okay. Hong Chang. Yeah. Okay, we'll begin the video. Yeah. He is. Uh... Thank you for letting me present. Today, on behalf of Dr. Chow, I am proud to present to you the topic discussing about effectiveness and ureteroscopic stent placement for upper urinary tract infection associated with obstruction. My name is Dr. Fong. I am a urologist, been practicing urology for five years at the Department of Emergency at Bending Hospital from Vietnam. The talk will be divided into six parts. Firstly, I will talk about some information related to the topic. Secondly, I will explain about characteristics of patients' methods we choose. Subsequently, we will examine the results and share our opinions and some take-home messages about them. We know that complicated urinary tract infections secondary to urinary tract obstruction caused by stone or stricture, etc., may result in sepsis if we don't treat properly. In these cases, what we should do immediately is to prescribe empirical antimicrobial therapy and consider urinary tract decompression. Retrograde urethral double J stent placement and percutaneous nephrostomy or PCN decompression appear to be equally effective through many previous researches. However, in some mild to moderate obstruction cases, retrograde urethral double J stent placement appears to provide more comfort for patients than PCN with less risk of bleeding or organ injury. However, Regarding to the method of exerting double J stent, what should we do? Should we do cystoscopy or retrograde urethroscopy for double J stent placement? It is known that in some cases, stenting while doing cystoscopy can be really hard. And in, in uh, these cases, URS needs to be done. In addition, uh, there are few evidence showing that retrograde double J stent placement increases severity of urosepsis. Therefore, we did a study to confirm the effectiveness and safety of the procedure in urinary tract infection, secondary to obstruction in Vietnam setting. In a study, all patients admitted to the hospital presenting with infected hyronephrosis, urosepsis, and or septic shock associated with renal or urethral obstruction from April 2016 to April 2017 were chosen. All of them were managed with empirical antimicrobial therapy followed by urgent urethroscopy with double J stent placement. And, uh, and the study was designed in retrospective and prospective case series report. Here, we also checked if the patients had a systemic inflammatory response syndrome and also if they met criteria of urosepsis or septic shock. And the board here review four features of SRS and two of more features uh, are defined as ISRS. And we found out interesting results. 1,083 cases were included, with 95% of them were diagnosed with infected hyronephrosis, which was defined with urinary tract infection proximal to obstructing causes, can be stone, or stretcher, etc. And 2.8% or 30 cases were diagnosed with SRS. 2.2% or 34 cases were diagnosed with septic shock. And all of these infection cases were associated with an upper urinary tract obstruction secondary to urethysis or stricture. There were some special circumstances that we need to review. 60, uh, 68 patients were pregnant. 
22 of them had acute kidney injury, 33 had bilateral urethral obstruction, 8 patients had only one kidney, and 5 patients had horseshoe kidney. The length of hospital stay, including ICU stay, ranged from 7 to 20 days. ICU admission and length of stay depended on severity of the infection at intervention. Positive urine cultures were found in 78.8% of cases. Moreover, double J stent placement was needed to be redone in three cases, uh, in 10 cases, sorry. All of these cases had double J stand inserted without CM guidance at the first place. Neither post-operative exacerbation of infection nor death was reported in this study. So after investigating the results of the study, there are three things needed to be discussed. Firstly, what should we choose between percutaneous nephrostomy and retrograde double J stand placement? Secondly, Regarding to the double J stand placement, should we do cystoscopy or URS? And finally, do we really need CRM guidance in retrograde urethral stenting? Well, it all depends. But first of all, the question is right here. Percutaneous or double J stand placement? Firstly, we know that these methods are equally effective drainage methods in emergency settings. However, retrograde double J stenting decompresses through natural cavity of the human body, causes less damage to the patient, less risk of bleeding or other organ injury, and provides greater comfort for patients than PCN, especially when there is mild to moderate obstruction in urinary tract. In the study, 56 0.4% of cases were mildly or moderately obstructed. These cases are often chosen for double J stand placement. In some special circumstances, such as horseshoe or solitary kidney, retrograde double J stenting is usually considered safer than percutaneous nephrostomy, which increased the risk of hemorrhage or kidney failure. However, in more severely obstructed cases, we think that retrograde stenting would be difficult than PCN can be chosen. So it really depends on the evaluation of surgeons and specific circumstances. In this case, we just needed to use local anesthesia. The procedure was quickly done with no damage to your retract and no bleeding. The second question is regarding to retrograde stenting. Should we do URS or cystoscopy? Before doing the study, we had been so worried about the risk of URS in these circumstances. But technically, double J stent insertion is difficult in unique cases with a large impacted urethral stone or kinky urethral proximal to transitional point which can be stone or stricture or urea tract compression from tumor. In this case series, we use load irrigation device, which is approximately 100 to 150 millimeters of saline used. When the scope is distal to the transitional point, intrarenal pressure would not increase significantly. And that happened, we increase force of irrigation gradually to see clearly into passing the point. And when we pass the point, we also keep the pressure low enough to move in the scope upward into the renal pavots. Also, the result show neither exacerbation of infection nor death, indicating the procedure is effective and safe. So this is a video uh, answering the question the third question, do we need CM Gardens while standing? Let's watch this first. <laughs> okay. So that presenting the kinking ureter proximal to the obstructing point. In these cases, we uh, when we move the scalp upward into renal pelvis is is really challenging. So, 
to make sure that proximal pigtail of the double J stent is accurately placed in the renal pivots, the procedure should be done under CM guidance. Without it, these stents could not run urine effectively. Also in these uh, circumstances, CM guidance help us reduce the volume of saline irrigation as well as intrarenal pressure, which will improve efficacy and safety of the procedure. So this slide summarizing three points that I just said to you. And CM guidance really helps us decrease the volume of irrigation and improve the effectiveness and safety of the procedure. So the key to successful drainage of urine in urinary tract infection secondary to obstruction is that the proximal head of the double J stand must be placed in the right place. The renal pivots. The video demonstrates that the proximal pigtail of the double J stand was in the renal pivots. So, in conclusion, ureteroscopy with double J stand placement is safe and effective in upper urinary tract infection associated with obstruction. The procedure should be done as soon as possible under CM guidance to provide better outcomes for patients. That is the end of the talk. Thank you for your attention. We hope that one day we can welcome you to our hospital in Vietnam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Fong. Uh, we all know that urinary tract infection can manifest in a wide clinical range, from bacteria with uh, limited clinical symptoms to sepsis, severe sepsis or sepsis shock. Depending on localized or uh, systemic extension in 20 to 30 upon septic patient. The infectious focus is uh, localized in the urinary tract. 78% of patients show urinary obstruction as a predisposing factor, and the remaining 20, 22 show urinary with significant impact on urodynamics. 70% of patients develop urosepsis after uro urological intervention. Obstructive disease of uh, the urinary tract leading to obstructive bilonephritis are caused in 65% by urethral stone, in 21% by tumor, in 5% by pregnancy, in 5% by abnormality of urinary tract in tract and in for following operation. Patients with UTI urosepsis associated with urinary tract obstruction occasionally require cranius, primarily via ureteric standing or ne nephrostomy. However, the indication for early ureteric standing for this condition have not been clearly defined. Today, today, Dr. Fong already remark and discuss how we can manage the obstruction of urinary tract in emergency department. In coverage cranial by CG stand or extra coverage cranial nephrostomy, the appendix and the limitation. Thank you. Now we, uh, we continue to discuss up, uh, to article. Okay, you can keep a uh, peanut discussion about the, the above two topic. Do you have any discuss, uh, question and discuss with the speakers? Yes. Okay. Professor uh, Kim. Yeah, yes. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Fong, and first of all, 
Uh, thank you for sharing your uh, data with a large number of patients. And uh, my question is whether uh, do you consider the voiding function of the patient when you're putting in the double J stand for the patient with the UTI with the obstruction? Uh, because they might have, in fact, the uh, outcome regarding the UTI. Maybe it can aggravate the UTI in some cases. And the second question is that um, uh, it will probably be uh, the surgeon's discretion, uh, but uh, do you do it the double just stenting for all UTI patients, or and how the uh, COVID situation kind of affected the uh, the practice pattern pattern in any way? Those are my two questions. Thank you, Professor, for your very uh, interesting question. Uh, first of all, about the uh, double J stand placement before doing this research, we were so worried about the aggravation of the double J stand placement via, via URS. But after after done in over than uh, 1000 cases, uh, we found a very interesting result that uh, the double J stand placement via URS is very safe, very safe and uh, effective. Actually, we use a low irrigation device. We keep the uh, uh, irrigation speed low enough to see to pass the ureteroscope, uh, passing the transitional point to the renal pelvis. And after one to two days, the patients uh, can come back with uh, better outcomes. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so we, we, we really believe, we really believe that uh, this procedure is safe. And uh, we've been practicing this URS uh, with double G stand placement at the Young Hospital for over five years. Yeah. And uh, the, about relating to the uh, second questions about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, actually it really, it really affects how we uh, treat patients. But in urosepsis, especially moderate to severe sepsis, uh, we uh, need to have a rapid test first. If the rapid test come back negative, then we can uh, actually uh, insert a double J stand in these uh, patients as normal. But if uh, the rapid test come back positive, we need to have a specific, uh, uh, specific uh, things to do. Uh, actually, uh, we need to uh, isolate the patients and do the procedure. But, as, uh, but before doing the procedure, we need to uh, prescribe the patient a going to micro, micro, uh, microbial therapy fastly enough, really quickly. And uh, we, need to do, we need to do the procedure quickly after that. So uh, it's just about the, the, uh, the, the, the how, how we can isolate the patient with positive COVID-19 patient. If negative, things uh, gone normal. Thank you for your for your very interesting question. Yeah, thank you uh, your question. I uh, I also uh, contribute uh, some opinion. Yeah, uh, with the urinary infection in the first time, we uh, we not there to uh, to do your urethroscope. Yeah, but uh, you can see. In uh, in uh, many cases, the urethro, the urethro kin kin, kin kin. So so with the cystoscope, we cannot we cannot place a double G stand. So we have to we have to urethro scope. We have to do urethro scope and combine and combine and combine with the CR, combine with the CR to, uh, to- Recording uh, stopped. Yes. Recording in progress. Thank you. So I have one question. Is it okay? Can I ask questions okay? So first of all, so thank you for your good presentations. So I have uh, some questions. So uh, for Dr. Hong Trang, yeah, second session, I think. 
So maybe, as you said, so effective, so maybe I think retroscopic extent of placement is sometimes a seismic effect. So in some cases, I, I asked one question, what kind of indications do you think so to do the retroscopic extent placement? I think uh, all, pa all patients, so maybe don't select so in this in this method by so what kind of indications do you mind? Uh, thank you for your question, Professor Inu. Uh, yeah. Uh, when patients come to the department of emergency, uh, especially with the uh, with the diagnosis of the uh, urinary tract infection secondary to obstruction, especially urophysis or stricture. We need to uh, decompress, decompress the urinary tract uh, quickly and effectively. So we have uh, two methods, the percutaneous nephrostomy and uh, double J stand placement uh, here, retrograde double J stand placement. So uh, all, of these, all of these methods are both effective effective, but percutaneous nephrostomy uh, is considered more damage, yeah. uh, more bleeding. And uh, in, in, in some mildly to moderately obstructed urinary tract uh, kidney and uh, percutaneous nephrostomy can cause uh, damage, especially bleeding uh, through the, the, the kidney renal parenchyma. So uh, basically, uh, we will uh, we will require the double J stand placement first, but after the, the, the procedure fail, then we will change the method into the percutaneous nephrostomy. Yeah, but in some very severe, very severe obstructed obstructed cases, we can do the percutaneous nephrostomy uh, quickly. Uh, at best, at uh, best sign, yeah. Yeah, I think so. So I agree with you. So maybe in severe cases like uh, so septic shock or severe sepsis, so maybe uh, time is very faster. Time is very important, I think. So maybe uh, at that time, so maybe I my in my opinion, so maybe I choose we choose the so placement of a uh, natural stomach too. I think. So I think uh, so in some cases. So ultrascopic stent placement is better, better, so useful, I think. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question to the Dr. Duo for the dunial laser transurethral resection of bladder tumor. Uh, Dr. Duo, are you there? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. And uh, what is your laser setting about your your tunnel laser resection? And uh, how do you remove remove the tumor after your resection? Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you uh, for your uh, good question. Uh, the, in my uh, studies, I uh, uh, use thulium laser analog resection and lock recession, yes. Uh, uh, using the fibers uh, follow the uh, video. Yes. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, uh, after that, I uh, will uh, uh, suction uh, uh, the tumors uh, uh, outside the black. Yeah? Thank you. And, uh, and in, uh, in this study, and in this study, uh, we uh, we chose uh, the tumor about uh, two centimeters, two centimeters. Yeah, so that uh, we can do the unlock session. Yeah, the two now uh, some advantage is uh, is that uh, our no obturator reflex, so we can complete the procedure. It's very important for the URBT, but. Tulum have, uh, have some uh, have some limitation. It is uh, the burn tissue. Burn tissue. It means that you can you can uh, 
you can get the the, the good specimen for the pathology. Yeah. Uh, 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 I see your video. You perform the inoculation of a tu uh, of tumor. You will mark the the uh, circular of the tumor. Uh, but for my yeah. case, I prefer to leave uh, uh, some surgical margin or a little far from the tumor and uh, circle the uh, the bladder tumor. Why why you why your line is so close to the tumor? Root. Will you leave some space about the um, for the surgical margin? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Doctor Lee. Uh, the first, uh, I must the uh, first season the recess with uh, one centimeter. Yes. Uh, uh, one centimeter wide. So then I connect the muscles and uh, uh, reset deep to the muscle blazer like the Yes. Uh, it's important to ensure sufficient depth and uh, wish around the bladder tumor until the end. Okay, thank you. Uh, one yes. centimeter yes. space. Yeah, one centimeter. Yeah, thank that's you. around. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, up, uh, about the technique, about the technique. Yeah, after we marking, marking the uh, marking the machine. Yeah, we uh, we can uh, use the detach, detach, detach technique, detach technique, uh, so that the tissue not burn. Yeah, we will use uh, tulium for coagulation. Yeah, so we can keep the specimen better. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Excuse me. My name is Lin Zhenjia. I'm from Changga Memorial Hospital, Kilong Division. Uh, about uh, Dr. Fong, uh, the, you, you I, I echo the opinion like Dr. Inoue. You know that the, for infections, obstructive opacity, you place the double J for pre-operation. Yes, double J is not so traumatic like PCNL. And but you have some risk because you have to put irrigation some fluid into it for for a serious serious sepsis. It, this small amount of fluid maybe got worse, and PCN yes is traumatic traumatic a little bit than double J. But from view of the infection control, I always think PCN is a better infection drainage way. You know when we get to the retrograde internal surgery after the drainage, the, the past accumulation in the kidney is much less in PCNL chair, the PCNL group. So there is these two kinds of drainage, yes, they are rare advantage, but for some, if the stone is impacted severely and the infection is severely and the hydro is much moder moderate, yes, I think PCNL may be a better choose, is my personal opinion, thank you. Uh, thank you for your opinions. Uh, it actually depends on the uh, uh, surgeon experience and availability of the uh, instruments at the hospital and the uh, patient's preference. But uh, in some urosepsis cases, especially severe urosepsis or septic shock, and the patients, uh, the patients had uh, severely, uh, severely obstructed urinary tract, then PCN. Uh, should be the first choice because we can do it at the bedside and uh, can do it with the local anesthesia. Uh, but uh, some in some very in some very mildly uh, obstructed case, especially tumor compressed the uh, urea retract, uh, we need to uh, we need to, we need to decompress quickly. Uh, but uh, we, we prefer the retrograde double J stent placement. Yeah. But um, uh, as I, as I uh, don't know as I uh, uh, the, uh, consider the, the the severity of the obstruction of the urinary tract, we may prefer the patient than the uh, double J stent placement. 
thank you yeah thank you dr chen this is a big discussion a big discussion there are many controversial in this opinion yeah in uh, in our study more than 1000 cases uh, there is a, there is about uh, 30 30 cases with uh, septic shock yeah after we we do place the WG stand on a case, reduce the severe level. Yeah. And if we use BCL, there are many, many limitations with the basin with pregnancy, the basin with solitary kidney, the basin with Hoxhu kidney. Yeah. In our, in our study, there are, there are about 68 pregnancy, a case of solitary kidney and five hox two kidney. Yeah, it is a, a advantage of the uh, position in uh, in this case. Yeah, uh, I would just like to add one comment on what Dr. Fong mentioned. I somewhat agree with what you're saying, but regarding the uh, tumor extrinsic compression, uh, the cause that causes the uh, hydronephrosis, I don't, I don't think it's uh, better to use the uh, double J stent. I think it's rather using a PCN would be a better choice because of the uh, uh, the um, malfunction of the double J stent may be uh, expected in the cases. And uh, I would like to ask Dr. Nguyen uh, one question. Uh, the uh, advantage of doing an in-block TRB, one of the advantage would be uh, having a good detrusor muscle in the specimen. So uh, what was your uh, detrusor muscle uh, presence rate? Could you share that with us? Dr. Okay. Dr. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, because uh, my son, uh, European Association of uh, Urology, uh, uh, we uh, can use a uh, trulium laser to unlock recession and uh, the uh, uh, the five the, the fibers in the muscle laser, uh, 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 I think uh, it's uh, not uh, effective uh, for the uh, uh, invasive black the tumor. Yeah. Uh, about about uh, about your your question up. Bro, about Dr. Kim, yeah. Uh, as uh, we as we discussed, uh, we uh, when we use uh, tulium, we should use uh, detaching, detaching, detaching the technique to get the specimen. Yeah. Um, the limitation of tulium is uh, is uh, there a uh, little right. Uh, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot uh, rattling us staging exactly the muscle invasive bladder cancer. Yeah, because uh, the tissue is uh, influenced. Okay. Thank uh, you. Is there any question about the Vietnam section? Okay, now we move on to uh, our Taiwan section. Uh, please, Professor Lin. It's my honor to introduce the next section talk speaker, uh, Dr. Li Xiangying. Uh, Dr. Li practiced at Kaohsiung Univer Medical University Hospital. And the other speakers, Dai Yi Sheng, 
He practiced at Fuzhen Catholic uh, University Hospital. They would like to introduce some challenging and difficult case of IRS. And Dr. Lee, please. Okay. And hello, everyone. Uh, here I'm trying, uh, I'm uh, share some interesting cases in our eyes. The first two cases, uh, we talk about the disease about uh, renal diverticular stones. This is a 35 years old female. She complained about the intermittent right flank pain for many years. When he first time to come to my consultation, and we can see we can see the stone are over there, but from the KUB, we did not know uh, the stones are within gallbladder or within the kidney. So I, we further arrange abdominal CT for the patients. Uh, as you see, we can see the renal stones are over upper pole kidney. So uh, in this scenario, do you think uh, what is your surgical choice for this patient? Mini PCNO or RIS? So of course, both surgery have advantage and disadvantage. For mini PCNO in Taiwan, we, uh, the cost is cheaper than RIS. And also because the tract of the PCNO is larger than ureter shoes. So the surgical time is maybe will shorter than RIS because we can wash out the fragments more efficiently. As you see from the abdominal CT, because the stones are within upper callus, upper callus so maybe the puncture from the upper callus is more, uh, more difficult and maybe will dangerous to injury to our uh, pleura or colon. And for the RIs, because the surgery is less invasive and there is no PCN wood, maybe for, for patients, they will think it's uh, more easy. But uh, because uh, you can see maybe the stones are maybe within the parenchyma, from the image, we, we, we are not sure if we can identify the stones from the ureter scope. So after discussion with the patients and we, we, decide, we decide to uh, perform our eyes first, and then if, the, if I can identify, identify the stones from, uh, from the ureter scope, I will shift our procedure to the mini PCNLO. So luck, uh, we are lucky, fortunately, when I perform the surgery, we can identify the neck of the diverticulum and uh, we use the homeo laser to incise of the neck of the uh, diverticulum as large as possible. You can see we use the uh, laser energy is about one gel and uh, the, uh, about the maybe uh, 30 frequency. You can see uh, when we incise the neck, we can go into the diverticulum in, over the kidney, we can see many circles, circles, stones within the diverticulum. But uh, when we perform this surgery, it's, it's, it, we need to uh, be careful not to injure the renal parenchyma or the vessel uh, the, uh, so large because that will, incre will increase the risk of bleeding. And the bleeding will blur our surgical margin and the surgical field. So we only will incise the neck as large as possible. So after one month of the surgery, we can check or we check from the KUB, you can see the there's no residual stones over the upper pole or upper pole caddis, but the double Z migration up to the ureter. So we remove the double J with the ureter scope. The second patient is a 42 years old female. The patient have a recurrence UTI and she also complained about the refractory flame pain. And she ever received several times SWLOs, but as you see, 
uh, the uh, the the effective is not is low because the residual residual stones are noted are still noted from the um, from the image. So we further check the IVP. You can see the IVP or the contrast can contour our collecting system. And you can we can identify the neck of the diverticulum and where is the stone is. So after the IVP, we can uh, discuss with the, with the patient as, and the plan our surgical surgical method. And so we we suggest patient to perform the RIs. And similar, we also use homeo laser to incise the the neck of the diverticulum and enlarge the hole and the, we can approach to the diverticulum cavity and disintegrate the stones as possible and wash out this, this stone fragmentations. And what is the Coliseal diverticulum? Uh, it's a congenital abnormalities and it is non-secretory urocidian light cavities in this diverticulum, it's filled with uh, urine that from adjacent collecting system because the majority are asymptomatic. So the incidence rate might be uh, underestimated. So we need to keep in mind, maybe there are uh, some part of the patient have diverticulum stones, which can cause them some uh, symptom. So what is the indication for the treatment? If a patient have some symptom, including flame pain or recurrent uh, infection or hematuria, we need to we can give some patients treatment for the, for uh, surgery to remove these stones. There are some classification for diverticular stone. Type one is the most common type, which is uh, over upper kidney pore. The type two is central located. There are another endoscopic classification. Uh, it according to the size of the neck. If the neck is large, uh, maybe we can choose ESWL with, uh, for this patient. And if the uh, neck is short and narrow, RIS may be uh, treatable for this patient. But if the neck is too long or too narrow, uh, RIS might be uh, not e efficient for, um, for this patient. So we need to choose a PCL or mini PCL for this kind of patients. So what's the uh, tips for the diverticular stone? So uh, for better planning, preoperative imagery is important. We can arrange some um, kind of uh, ureteral pyrography or brute test to identify the location and the, the, of the diverticulum and the neck. If we can see the pictures, maybe we can comment, uh, recommend the patients to receive, to receive what kind of surgery. And also, if we identify the, the neck or the opening, it must be enlarge the neck to avoid recurrence. Because if you, you don't enlarge the hole, maybe the fragmentation or the dust we are within the diverticulum and they, they cannot uh, wash out or can flow down to the bladder. And what is the important is um, from the previous reviews, at this one metabolic abnormality uh, of this kind of diverticulum stone. So we need to um, arrange some metabolic evaluation for these patients to uh, avoid recurrence. The case three is the renal AVM. Uh, it's a, also an interesting, interesting case. This is a 83 years old female. The patient, uh, the patient complained about the gross hematuria, mass hematuria, and the fever with cheerness. And as we see the data, the laboratory data check, the hemoglobin dropped down markedly. And then the patient's past history is she ever received PCN drainage and uh, uh, renal cyst alcohol ablation. So because of the much, uh, much hematuria, we arrange uh, abdominal CT. As you see, you can see the abdominal CB, the, 
there are feeding defect in the renal pelvis and the, and the ureter and the ureter. So because we want to differentiate from, uh, from this, uh, this feeding defect, maybe blood clots or ureter tumor or renal pelvis tumor. So we arrange RIs for survey. And then when we perform the RIs, uh, we did not uh, discover any tumor over renal pelvis or the ureter, but we accidentally find a hole over the upper polar caddis. And when we wait a while, we can see the bleeding from the hole. So this is the video. Yes, and this is the renal AVM. I want to show you when we, when we perform the RIs, the scope is over upper caddis. We can see the hole over here. And the, when, when we wait here for a while, you can see the bleeding from the hole. So because uh, we, did, we find, find, this, uh, find this phenomenon for this patient, so we suspect the patient maybe have renal AVM. Maybe it is the cause to make the patient suffer from gross hematuria. So because of this finding, we consult radiologists for angiography. So we can, so really we, we've discovered it's uh, upper pore renal AVM. So the patient received embolization for the AVM to stop the bleeding. So the, AT, the etiology of the AV, renal AVM may be acquired or congenital. The possible, the possible mechanism is maybe trauma to the renal tissues previously. As our patient, the patient ever received PCN insertion and the alcohol ablation, maybe it will increase uh, the risk of AVM uh, formation. And if the patient have underlying mobility, such as uh, cardiovascular disease or renal impairment, the patient uh, is vulnerable to the PCN procedure. So we need to keep in mind. So if the patient received any previous uh, procedure, now and uh, then the patient received uh, suffer from from recurrent hematuria or delayed hematuria. We need to keep alert that maybe patient will have uh, AVM. And the, because we, we often uh, treat patient with RIs, the procedure of RIs also will injury of the renal tissues. We need to keep in mind because the high intrarenal pressure or the thermal injury of the laser will also increase the risk of renal AVM formation. So we need to be careful when we perform the procedures. So above was uh, my presentation. Thank you. And next, uh, we introduce the welcome the Dr. Tai for their case presentation. Thank you. Can can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now I will share my uh, slide. And, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I I am Dr. Tai Shen. Uh, it's my honor to share my RS experience. And uh, uh, today I choose the uh, fascinating case and will share some tips to, uh, uh, to how to improve the eyes procedure and to how to avoid the com complications. Okay, this, is, th this case is the uh, most uh, frightening and exciting case I have ever done. So this is a 60, a 76 year old woman has medical history of hypertension, type 2 DM, hyperlipidemia, And they also have left renal stone and received the PN LOS three or four years ago. So he came, came to the, my colleague Uraj's clinics and uh, present the recurrent hematuria, dysuria. Hey, Dr. Dai, we, we don't see your PowerPoint. Okay, I okay. share again. Can you share again? Can you see? Okay, the okay. Yes, now we can see you your normal? slides. Okay. 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 So, uh, our our colleague, the urologist, was referred this patient for me for the le uh, left stack, big stone and the recurrent pyonephritis. So you can see the KUB and the renal echo in the first visit. 
So you can see the fuzzy appearance of the huge stack home stone right side is the gold stone. So, and the ultrasound, you can see the big, the acoustic shadow. So my first impression is a uh, stack home stone. So for the complex renal stone cases, we always do the non-contrast CT to evaluate how complex, difficult the renal stone is and the, how struggle the RI surgeon or ESA surgeon will be. What is the complex renal stone? My definition is the stone is really large, like for a stack home stone or multiple stone or with some anatomical abnormalities as hydro or patient's obesity, or he has previous uh, surgical uh, PCNL, especially if patient told you he has bad experience to the uh, stone surgery. So we can see the RIs, uh, some parameters will be the difficult RIs. The first is stone size more than 25 centimeter or uh, stone location in low pore or the narrow infundibular pelvis angle, especially local stone or the hard stone. The CT household unit will greater than one thousand or some autonomic elements like structural duplication, hydronephrine or horseshoe kidney. They will uh, change the strategy uh, with how, how we uh, deal with stones. Uh, you can see it's the summary of uh, our patients uh, CTs. So let's zoom in the figures and the final detail. You will find it is, it's not just the ordinary stack home or survive stones, a lot of findings. So the first, uh, the stone size is really big, uh, more than five centimeters in length. And uh, the stone density, the maximum density is more than 1,000. So it's compatible with a uh, uh, stack home stone with mixed uh, casting oscillate and the survive. The second, you can find the air, air pocket in the upper Oh, the uppercase of stone. So, so uh, it really compatible the chronic infection. So the the uh, this woman has the chronic and severe infection. We call the MVC metas pyelonephritis. So actually, we can find it in the renal echo, but it, it, in this side, but it really got missed if you don't do the CT. And then we can find the the uh, the vintage of a PNL. We can find. The, the stone in the PCN tract and you can find a uh, urinoma. So it's compatible with the back experience of the last surgery. And you can find a low pole, get atrophy. So get a seen the cortex and the low pole with in fact different stenosis and calyxial stones. So quite a lot of interesting finding in these patients. So next steps, I we just discussed the pro and cons to our family and set the treatment goals. For the EPN, we need to Get the uh, give the patient empirical antibiotics at least uh, phenylalanine or two to three generations of phosphorine at least, and uh, we prepare the ICU after operations because the st st stone the size is really bigger. I uh, I suggest patient receive the ethers. I think it's most. It's better for both patient and surgeon, but because it's it, bad experience, he refused any puncture, any PCNL to in your kidney. So we finally, we agree the staging IRIs. So because uh, we prepare a high power laser and we use the single use flexible uh, instrument to avoid the, the instrument damage. So for the stone treatment, we set a different goal for the upper and middle stone, which obstructed uh, the urinary tract and cause the infection and EPN, we must remove the stone clearly. But for the low pole stone, actually, uh, because the uh, first, the, the low pole is atrophy, and the second, uh, the stone must have a high risk uh, with the infundibular stenosis. If we put the our flexible into the stenosis, the instrument will be encased. So if you fire laser in the encased specimen, the, the pressure will get really high. So uh, maybe they will get the, the kidney injury, kidney rupture, hemorrhage, or urinoma, get the more, the more higher risk complications. So our, we don't want to charge a low renal stone. So I explain to patient, we just remove the upper and the middle stones and keep the 
low pulse down and avoid the more complications. So uh, in the operation, we have some thing we'll keep in mind carefully to make the operation more uh, effective and uh, safer. The first, we need to control appropriate intra-renal pressure. Uh, as um, many speakers mentioned before, uh, renal, uh, intra-renal pressure is most important things to avoid the complication of both infection or thermal injury. So for this case, we want to check up uh, SHG as high as we can do, and uh, we need to keep the fluidness drainage, and uh, we can lower intra-renal pressures. So in this case, we can find a, a turbid urine with some tiny stone fragment was drained fluidly. That means the, the irrigation can get, uh, go in and the drainage function is good. That means the intramural pressure will be not really high. That will make the uh, the surgery will be the surgery the surgery will be safer. And then we crush the pelvis and the upper renal stone first. Uh, we use the uh, old uh, this autopsy technique we can do, dusting outside and uh, the fragmenting the uh, tough inside cone, and we use the basket to remove the fragment. And then we reposition the low, low pole middle pole stone to the upper pole. I think it's very important because if you're banging over your instrument into the low pole middle pole, uh, it's not easy to do the things. And the third, we as we estimate the the picture was the uh, intraoperative picture, we can see there's really stenosis in front of the low pole. If you put our flexible into incise uh, and fire the laser, that will cause the really high, extremely high pressure in the encased space and it causes the renal ruptures. So many, many factors will uh, cause the RIS complication, the most complication infection, thermal injury or hemorrhage. But I think the most important issue is intrarenal pressure. And also intrarenal pressure was affected by a lot of things. Pumping system, the pressure, the flow, and the flexible type, the empty channel, or you put a basket laser, or angulation, or this autopsy. And uh, you just, you literally and the, uh, Patient's anatomy. So I, I just get, get give share my simple experience. I we start with a uh, pumping system with the pressure about 100 to 150 uh, cm H2O, just to make the really clear region. Because if you have a blurry region, you you make bleeding, they will get things worse. If if you if you can see clearly, we will. Uh, upgrade your pressure, I, I think it's not good things. And we'll keep the fluid and sheet drainage and just keep a slightly dilated renal pelvis case and uh, adjust the pressure as low as possible. So uh, it's the post-operative results. We use the about 300 times to finish this stone, uh, just a little longer than uh, most paper or my teacher suggest, but I, because I I think uh, my drainage function is good, so I, I I just want to do more time. So I, I think the result is good. You can see it's upper case against middle case. We just uh, almost uh, the upper and the middle pole stone was uh, almost free. And I keep some tiny stone fragment in, into the upper pole. And this is a big souvenir to my patients and uh, the post op the uh, urine is really clear and the vital signs is stable. As we plan, uh, yeah, we, we have some residual stones at, in the middle and telex, just we discussed before. And uh, I'm so, uh, I think it's the right things because if we want to remove those stones, but you, maybe you can get a high, high complications. So. But uh, it's just the fascinating cases, share my experience. So uh, actually it's really complicated cases, but if we do something, we get the uh, well prepared, that we have uh, the better surgical tips and uh, we still can uh, deal with those complications even with EPN carefully in the single sur 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 surgery. So, what have I learned from this case? The first, we need to do the non-contrast CT from complete 
you release this because the uh, KOB and the echo is not enough. You may miss something like the infection or like the uh, uh, anatomical anomaly. So, and the bad patient, patient told you you have a bad treatment experience means this, this stone is the very complex, the tough guys. The second, you need to keep in mind the safety, safety, safety. First, the, the for safety for patient, you need to adequate the prophylactic or uh, empirical antibiotics. And uh, you need to keep your safety to instruments. So for some common cases, we always use a single use uh, flexile scope. And uh, you need to keep uh, uh, choose the, the surg uh, surgical technique you are familiar. I think it's good for surgeons. And we need to uh, set the pre op the goal and the intra-op radio strategy. And the intra-renal pressures is higher than we imagine. So especially we do the lysotripsy in the enclosed space. So just keep in mind, low pressure means safety. So we need to adjust the pumping system as low as possible to keep clear vision. And um, we need to keep the fluid sheet drainage and uh, reposition stone to upper world, to upper world. Uh, because we can reduce the flex, uh, flexible and the laser angulation. We will shorten your operation time and uh, make a uh, patient and the surgery more comfortable and safe. And finally, II is not the only way to treat your stones. If you, you find that the stone is too tough to, it's too struggle, use II still with. Why not try ESIS? Okay, it's my experience to share the interesting case and I uh, share some surgical tips and uh, I uh, thanks for your listening. I hope you can uh, uh, give some helpful information to the audience. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dai. I think maybe we move to the second moderator and we have a discussion after this session finish. So the next moderator, Dr. Uh, Anthony Ho. Um, okay, good afternoon, uh, dear colleague. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, the invitation uh, for me to come to this, uh, join in this meeting. And it's my honor to introduce the, the last speaker of this symposium, uh, Dr. Jeremy Thiel. Uh, Dr. Thiel is uh, my good colleague and is currently the Assistant Dean of External Affairs and also Assistant Professor of the Faculty of Medicine, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And he had a strong interest in neuro-oncology, including better cancer and prostate cancer. And he had uh, gained, gained a numerous awards. And in, just in last year, he got the SIU Innovator Award and also the outstanding young uh, person in Hong Kong. And so today, Dr. Jeremy will share with us about the topic on bipolar, how to get started. So Jeremy, please. So um, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, thank you for the uh, invitation to give this talk. Um, I decided to give this talk because although nucleation has been uh, introduced many years back, that the adoption of this technique is, um, I would say, rather lag behind. Um, in Hong Kong, for example, we probably have around five or six surgeons regularly doing um, prostate enucleation. But I also recognize that this procedure or this technique is not uh, really widely adopted in many Asian countries as well. And uh, the more I do this procedure, the more I think this is the way to go. And I hope that um, through this lecture, um, I'll be able to give some information, especially uh, to um, uh, younger colleagues who may want to try this procedure or adopt this procedure in their uh, clinical practice. So this uh, talk will be rather um, uh, technical, meaning that I will show a lot of surgical videos, uh, really telling um, you how to do it in a step-by-step -step, uh, manner. So first of all, enucleation, um, it's really very anatomical, meaning we follow uh, the prostate capsule uh, in every uh, cases. And uh, this is a very famous editorial by Thomas Herman saying that enucleation is enucleation, meaning that if we follow the same anatomical plane, it doesn't really matter what energy you use, be it bipolar, be it whole lab, be it tulium. Um, anatomically, 
the approach is the same. Energy is considered secondary. And so, you know, my, my suggestion is if you want to do this procedure, you, you, you should feel free to try out different types of energy. By the end of the day, it's really the surgical approach that matters. So choose the one that you prefer, that's fine, but an anatomy is most important. And for me, uh, I use bipolar most of the time simply because it's widely available in Hong Kong, it's easy. And um, um, sometimes um, if mosulator is an issue, then we can easily do a nucleation followed by resection. And for um, urologists who really start to do this procedure, I think this is also a good energy modality to adopt because in case you have difficulty, you're not comfortable, you can always convert to resection readily. And so um, I tend to use this. But of course, when compared to uh, laser and nucleation, in particular whole lab, uh, bipolar is more mechanical. So you use more blunt force when you try to dissect out the capsule, whereas uh, home emulation in particular, um, you will be able to kind of um, delineate the plane quite readily and easily without a lot of force. So with more experience, if you want to do whole lab, I think that's totally fine as well. And for bipolar, you can use slope, you can use button. It used to be a nucleation um, electrode, um, but I think um, you don't really need those specialized electrodes. So either loop or button will be fine. I think the, the two main issues about this procedure, why it is kind of less adopted um, in clinical practice. Number one, it seems to be quite um, technically uh, demanding, meaning that it's not easy to learn. There's a learning curve. And um, secondly, um, there's always a fear of urinary incontinence. And I think um, with my experience, I think it's actually not as difficult as one may expect. And with enough experience, actually um, a surgeon can overcome the fear of incontinence. So if a patient comes to me who wants a nucleation, basically I'm comfortable to tell the patient that uh, you may, you may have incontinence at the beginning, but actually most patients will recover fully shortly after procedure. And I think the key is really to understand the anatomy as shown here. So um, as you can see, this is a, a cross-sectional uh, anatomy of the prostate gland. What we want to do is really try to uh, follow the enucleation plane, which is a plane between the transition zone and the peripheral zone. This is a natural plane, uh, which is, I think, is actually the easiest part of the procedure, trying to define this plane. I think the more difficult part is actually um, the anterior part, because this is where the anterior fibromuscular um, tissue is. And it's not a natural plane, I would say. Uh, you will usually see some straight fibers coming from above. And if you want to cross um, uh, from the left to the right anteriorly, you can, but it's, you, you need to use a lot of force. And it's, it's not very ideal because you will damage the urinary sphincter if you use too much force. And this is, in my opinion, not a natural plane. And which means that when you deal with the tissue anteriorly, you should use more energy, either a bipolar energy or a laser. You need to divide these, these um, uh, anterior fibers uh, especially early on, early in the surgery, because you want to reduce the traction uh, to the sphincter as much as you can. And the second part, which is difficult, is about um, two areas. Number one is the bladder neck, and number two is the um, urinary sphincter. So this blue line is usually where uh, we create the annucleation plane. Um, this solely, the sphincter, very important. So we usually would try to divide up the sphincter part, the, the apical area to release the sphincter. Uh, so to maximize the urinary contents function afterwards. But the other part, which is challenging is actually the bladder neck because uh, when you develop the annucleation plane, you need an end point and an end point is the bladder neck area. Once you get into the bladder neck, you know, that's the end point. The problem is, especially when you go into the annucleation plane at the six o'clock position, Sometimes you would dig deeper and deeper and you go kind of behind the bladder and that can be very, very dangerous. And so during the procedure, um, um, I think it's always safer to go to the bladder neck, uh, not at the six o'clock, but rather over the anterior part, either two o'clock position or 
10 o'clock position is actually much safer. And once you get to the black neck, then you know uh, that's the end point. You can kind of circumscribe the black neck area quite nicely. And of course, the anterior uh, tissue will have to be divided. So these red areas are the areas that you need to kind of actively incise on before you can really uh, push the adenoma into the bladder. There are several important steps. First, release the mucosa. Um, uh, these are just my steps, my kind of habit. I would then enucleate the left lobe, uh, define the bladder neck at the one to two o'clock position, and then you kind of circumscribe downwards to a six o'clock position, proceed with the right lobe, the median lobe, and then you kind of go back up into the six to 11 o'clock position. And then finally, divide the anterior fibromuscular tissue and then proceed with mosulation. And it's really kind of tedious to see these steps. So I'm going to show some videos. So I think case selection is very important, especially when you learn, start to learn about the procedure. So I would suggest uh, to begin with, start with 50 gram to 80 gram, the maximum. Uh, these are considered, you know, the best cases for uh, learning about the procedure. And um, always try to mark and incise at the distal part where the sphincter is, especially at the anterior part. So this part, the upper part, always incise. And I try to go a bit more, dis, uh, more a bit more proximal to the bladder area to release as much anterior fiber as I can, because I believe that's where the most traction is going to be uh, exerted to the sphincter. And then you go downward, try to uh, release all the mucosa circumferentially before you proceed with enucleation, because we all believe that the preservation of the sphincter, the preservation of the mucosa uh, distally is the most important thing uh, to ensure a good urinary continence function. And then this part, although one may thought it's going to be difficult, it's act, in my opinion, is actually the easiest part. You enucleate using the resection uh, scope. When you see stones, it's actually a good sign because it's usually located at the junction between the transition and also the peripheral zone. With my experience, I, I, I realized that the enucleation plane is usually more lateral than you think and more superior than you think. And as you enucleate, you can always adjust your direction. My opinion is don't try to cross over to the other side because uh, it, will it will exert too much force to the sphincter. And uh, as you enucleate, you go bit by bit. So you enucleate uh, from six o'clock, three o'clock to 12 o'clock, and then you go back to six o'clock and then repeat this kind of circumferential uh, movement bit by bit. And then eventually you'll be able uh, to reach near the blood neck area. So this part, I'm going to show you what I think is the most important step of the procedure is to define the end point reaching the bladder neck safely. And as you can see um, in this enucleation, again, we go up, uh, always aim to aim um, at the one to two o'clock position because I believe this is area that's the easiest. When you start to see uh, big vessels like this, again, it's usually a good sign because they tend to occur when you go near the bladder neck area. And uh, you can uh, go from six o'clock to 12 o'clock. You can go back to six o'clock position. That's also fine. And because um, uh, prostate gland is kind of oval shape and size. So as you go proximally, you kind of need to move medially as well. And as you can see, when I reach to the one to 12 o'clock position, when I go back down, you can see the plane is being enucleated back to the six o'clock position uh, again. And this part, I want to show you kind of an, an edited uh, version because I want to, you to uh, be convinced that it's actually quite easy to get to a black neck safely at a one, two o'clock two position. At this point, I'm adjusting the fluids. But uh, once I have adjusted um, the fluid, then I will go back to the one to two o'clock uh, position. And then you can see, boom, we're into the black neck. So actually, you know, not so difficult if you aim at the one to two cock position and then always, always perform some kind of hemostasis because usually when there is bleeding, unrecognized, I would say it's at the black neck region. And now I'm kind of circumscribing it down to the six o'clock position again. So 
the whole left lobe from 12 to six o'clock landing area is kind of defined uh, in this case. And then um, you go back to the um, uh, apical area and you start with the enucleation of the right lobe, which basically it's similar to what I have done um, on the left side. But again, try to go more lateral and more superior than you expect. And because I'm a right-handed surgeon, um, you would actually realize that when you do the right lobe, it's, it's er ergonomically uh, not as comfortable, but you know, just have some more experience and with time you will kind of get used to it. And again, you go bit by bit until you kind of reach the blood neck area. For the right lobe, I won't get into the blood neck right away because I believe I already kind of defined the blood neck of the right side. So I will go from there. If you see an adenoma just now, um, uh, like, like what you see just now, then again, you go back a bit, you go more lateral until you reach the correct plane. And then afterwards, I will proceed with the median lobe. Um, in this case, you can see um, that's the tissue connecting into the vero. Sometimes when you are, when the patient is too, um, the, the level of the patient is too low, then you will see this kind of bubbling in front of you. You can tackle it by simply asking the anesthetist or the staff to kind of uh, raise the bed. Then you can overcome this. But these are just some tissue that um, uh, you need to release before you kind of connect um, the, the, the two lobes uh, together. So this is the left side. So I kind of um, go back from known to unknown. So you can see I'm lifting up the tissue using my resectoscope. And uh, if you have any um, doubt about the plane, you just go back to the left side and then you try to go from known to unknown. My goal here is really to avoid undermining of the um, um, uh, capsule. So you don't want to go below the bladder. So uh, if you see a nice plane, that's good. If you are not sure, again, go back from the left low bladder neck area, then you'll be very, very certain about um, the direction of the enucleation plane. You can see some tissue here. So you go back into the known area and then use your scope to kind of lift up the tissue again. And with time, uh, you should be able to reach the blood neck area right here. This is the blood neck incision area that I've made earlier on um, from the 12, three and six o'clock position. So now you can, again, proceed with the incision of the blood neck and then you can kind of um, continue the incision uh, from the six o'clock to the nine o'clock and to the 12 o'clock position. So as soon as you follow this plane, you'll be kind of able to circumscribe the whole adenoma. You can define the whole blender. And then at this point, you can kind of decide whether you want to proceed with resection if uh, morselation is not available or you proceed with the incision of the anterior fiber so we can release the whole uh, adenoma into the blood neck and then proceed with mosulation. You can see as you go upwards that eventually you will see some straight fibers from the anterior part. These are the um, uh, so-called the um, anterior um, fibromuscular tissue, which you will see better in the next video. So um, after defining the blood neck, so I'm at the apical region, I'm trying to do some um, hemostasis, but you can see as I go up, you'll be able to see some anterior tissue right here. These are the so-called the anterior fibromuscular tissue. So avoid trying to, you know, blunt dissect because you will exert a lot of force to sphincter inset proceed with incision. It doesn't matter really to leave some fibromuscular tissue behind. They are believed to contribute to better continence afterwards. And these tissue are not really adenoma per se. So uh, this is the other side. So again, you can see those uh, fibromuscular tissue. Then you incise on this tissue until you reach the blood neck area. And once you have excised all of them, then the whole blood neck can be, the whole uh, prostate adenoma can be pushed into the bladder. And then afterwards, um, you just proceed with mosulation. I know some people, uh, well, actually a lot of people would have two inflow of arrogance. Um, um, because they're afraid that the bladder may collapse um, and then you might result in inverted injury of the bladder. 
I know some people will just use one inflow. So in that case, you make sure that you have a good bite of the tissue before you actually press or pedal. But um, at the end of the day, um, just avoid injury to bladder. That, that should not be too difficult. So I think enucleation is actually not difficult. As, you, as soon as you know the anatomy, you, can, you have the patience to define it. And uh, but I, I think every step counts because if you have an area which you didn't do well, the plane is not good, you kind of get disoriented, then the procedure can become very, very difficult. So every step counts, patient, and every step is done correctly, then it should be um, very, very smooth. And usually you would be able to see uh, clear urine. Um, nowadays, when I do a nucleation, I may not put, in irrig put on irrigation at all. If there's any worry, I put on irrigation, but usually two or three hours later, if it's very clear like this, I'll just stop it. And now we'll take off the catheter the next day. And it's actually quite common to have 70 gram, 100 gram of, of prostate shipped in and nucleated. And uh, having a very good flow is usually what you see. Sometimes can be up to 70, 80 mil per second is actually not very uncommon at all. And in terms of uh, training, um, I myself, together with the um, Asian Urological Surgery Training and Education Group, OSTEC, has published um, a paper on that, uh, basically illustrating the different aspects about surgical training and how we can learn about the procedure, how we adopt it into clinical practice. So if you are interested, um, feel free to take a look. And in summary, I think enucleation is really the way to move forward. Finding a mentor to facilitate your learning curve certainly helps. Hands-on experience, very important. Um, for me, I love watching surgical videos. I think it, it really helps a lot. So um, there are a lot of available uh, videos online. So if you want to um, kind of get them the procedure, you can do some homework yourself. Start with good cases, 50 gram to 80 gram, and practice makes perfect. And um, uh, we used to um, arrange a lot of hands-on training. And now because of COVID, it's really difficult, but I hope with time when it uh, when the surgical courses organized by OSTEC can be arranged again. Certainly welcome uh, residents who want to learn about this procedure. And actually um, about one and a half year ago, um, I myself together with Anthony, together with Dr. Cho, we actually um, had a special issue on prostate enucleation, really covering uh, every aspect about prostate enucleation, bipolar lab, whole lab, two lab, uh, the history, pros and cons, uh, different outcomes, consonants, function, sexual outcome, uh, training, et cetera, et cetera. So this hosts issue more than 100 pages. If you are really interested about this procedure, then I will encourage you to look into it, or you can reach out to me if you want to have a copy. And by this, I would like to thank the organizing committee again. Um, thank you for the invitation. And I do miss you a lot, but um, I hope to you know see you again when COVID uh, permits. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jeremy, for your sharing. And I think now let's go into the discussion part. So. Okay, I, and, I have a question. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, I have a question for, for Professor Dr. Lee. Um, no, uh, uh, thank you for your experience, experience sharing about your Davidian stone. But no, when we do the, if we do the RIS for the Davidian stone, sometimes the outcheck of the Davidian is most difficult to find out. And the same condition like parapelvic cyst. Also, we ha it's very hard to find the nearest way to incision. Uh, I, I think I have to be some, we do the real time CT and just like we do in the hybrid room. I know hybrid room is very caustic, so not every hospital can afford it, but you have experience of the real time CT in hybrid room to, to find out the, the, the difficult check. Yeah, in our hospital, in the future, our, our hospital's operation room will create a new hybrid, hybrid uh, room, operation room, and with, uh, with CT simultaneously, yes, immediately. But, but of course, now we don't have this kind of CT. So preoperative image is, we only can uh, arrange preoperative image 
such as IVP or uh, abdominal CT with contrast, or we can use a blue test during our procedure. Only this, this kind of uh, method. Thank you. And, and uh, there's a question from the audience that for Dr. Dai Sen Dai. Yes, is Dr. Dai here? Yes. Yes, and the, 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 the audience's question is, why don't you put a PCN from the upper pore of the if it's not abscess area, that's much safer. But I think you have told that the patient seems refuse any PCN yeah. check. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, the first that the patient refused the PCN because he has the uh, etomis nightmare. So I think it's a top proceed experience for both patient and uh, the surgeons. The second, because the EP and the air pocket in the upper calyx is not uh, easy recognized uh, under the ultrasound. But if you want to see the guide procedure, I think uh, our radiologist for radiologists, they use CT guide. It's not easily uh, to do the upper pole puncture uh, easily. So I think the upper pole PCNL is not feasible on the uh, loss condition. The second, because his e uh, the her this patient's EPN is just the uh, mild EPN, a uh, class one EPN. According to guideline, if you do the well drainage and uh, the prolonged antibiotics, I think the RI surgery um, is the uh, safe. And uh, the preoperative, uh, pre I check the, the blood taste, the, the uh, white count is in the normal range. So I, in the first uh, discussion and in first my surgical plan, I don't, in the first, I don't uh, choose the PCN for the infection control. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Is there any? Is there any other questions from the audience? Uh, I have a question to Doctor Teo. And so after your excellent presentation, so I think everyone will tend to try to do the bipolar. But is there any contraindication or any cases that you think is not suitable for? for uh, bipolar? I think um, especially when we start to learn our procedure, case selection is really, really important. So um, small glands is not very good because the capsule is not very well defined, but when the prostate gland is too big, then it's become very challenging. So I'd say 50 to 80 grams is the best case. And of course we need to know about the important, um, 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 how would I say, traps about the procedure. One is about the sphincter. I'll always release the apex as, 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 as early as you can. Secondly, uh, avoid going to the six o'clock position too much because you may undermine the bladder, which can be a nightmare. And thirdly, uh, always beware about the ureteric orifice. Sometimes if you are able to define the bladder net well, it shouldn't be a problem. But um, if you don't take note of it and you might go more distally than more proximally than you think, then you might injure the uterus of us without noticing. So these are the main things or main, you know, the, 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 the worst cases that we don't want it to happen. And of course, you don't want to do it in cases where they are having on, you know, anticoagulants and all that. Although actually you have experienced, I believe enucleation works even better than the other procedure for those cases. But of course you don't start with those cases. Yeah. Thank you. I think Dr. Kim have a, have a question. Oh, yeah, I have a question to Dr. Tai. Tai. Yeah. Uh, for your case, um, do you consider doing a renal function test uh, in any point? And, uh, and would that kind of um, change your uh, treatment plan? And also, you have some remnant stones left in the um, stones in the kidney right now, which we were kind of Token, taking most of them out, but what's your plan on uh, for those remnant stones? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, because uh, 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 because uh, yeah, the first step I just uh, to uh, deal with the EPN, the obstruction, and the, the major stone, uh, and uh, because the low pole kidney. Uh, is atrophy and the, the calicell stone. Uh, 
so far it, it don't have any symptom and the infection was well controlled so uh because uh the the, the stone is really bigger so i i plan the staging surgery so the first step is finished um so i just uh the patient just uh, agreed to just get the close observation uh, uh, observation for the residual local stones so if the local stone uh, became the big trouble i think the mini piece nl will and or ethers surgery will be the better way to resolve these uh, complex situations we can use the uh, I are a piece mini mini perk uh, to find uh, the low post stone and uh, simultaneously we can use the IRS to incise the stenosis in infundibular to remove the 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 low pole calisthenic stone. But I, I why I don't uh, deal with the stone in the my first uh, uh, surgery because uh, I think. It, uh, the the bigger upper and middle stone will cause the uh, long times. I, I don't have enough time to deal with the low pole stone. And the second, I think the major obstruction and infection sources is come from the upper and middle pole stones. So I choose to treat the the upper and middle part first. Just keep the uh, lower case stones. So just uh, wait and see if. Uh, if a uh, patient is so lucky, no, in, uh, in fact, you, you can keep the uh, well infection control, no infection. I, I, I will just keep the, the stone uh, peacefully. Uh, but, but if the uh, stone get infected or get some symptom, I just I always suggest patient do the easy surgery to the, remove the, the infection sources in the stones. It's a, a really good and uh, uh, very difficult to answer these questions. It's, complex clinical scenario for me. Yeah. Okay. I have a question for uh, Dr. Jeremy. I, I wonder, what do you think about the anterior fibromuscular stroma? Do you think uh, the structure uh, will impact, impact the countenance after surgery? Will you reserve anterior fibromuscular trauma. Yes. Okay. Well, I think the most important structure for continence is still the distal urinary sphincter. So, you know, even after a radical prostatectomy, patients can have full continence. And that's the most important structure. So avoiding injury to that structure is more meaning that at the beginning of the procedure, you release as much as you can. But um, there are many people suggesting that the fibromuscular tissue may help. Yes. Um, I think the concept is that those tissue are not really adenoma per se. So it's not really necessary to remove them and it's unlikely to cause obstruction anyway. So people try to reserve, preserve uh, most of the so-called normal tissue as much as they can. In my opinion, still the sphincter is most important. If I see some tissue at the top after the whole adenoma has been re removed, I won't. I won't actively resect them because I think it's not necessary, but that's just my own preference. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I see it. Uh, it's a question for me. The how to prevent the percutaneous fistula tract in FAC beta patient? Is it is my question? Yes, right. actually, I asked that question <laughs> to you because okay. when I oh. uh, when I experience, I'm Dr. Song Yong Chu, and I uh, when I experienced the the emphysematous pyelonephritis cases, actually, I uh, the problem the the problem. Uh, well, I think the worst situation was the percutaneous fistula trait because there is much infection, inflammation inside the body. And then after I removed the older stones, or sometimes I left many stones in the separated calluses because of uh, infantibular stenosis. And I made three to five percutaneous tracts and tried to remove all the stones in the separated calluses. But actually, because of the infection and inflammation, yeah, we, uh, we could see some uh, fistula track. So 
Uh, well, finally, I uh, uh, try to explain the necessity of nephrectomy to my patients with this uh, physical, uh, uh, physical track. So, well, uh, maybe uh, two weeks later, I have another case of nephrectomy after I performed the PCNL with emphysematous <laughs> pyelonephritis. So, I want to ask when, uh, this question to all the speakers here: if you have any your own tips and tricks to control the infection and the yeah, fistula and so on. Okay, uh, it's a good question from Dr. Zhou. And uh, 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 it, we, um, uh, my patient and the, uh, me is so lucky because the infestimatous pyelonephritis of my patient is just mild and the, uh, the class one is it's not really severe. So uh, that means his air pockets just in the collecting system. So mm -hmm. it, his urocellium is intact. So uh, when I uh, do the uh, IRS into the uh, kidney, do the KCL, you can find the all whole, the whole collecting system, the mucosa is intact, maybe some inflammation but it's intact. I think it's very important because it depends on the different severity of emphysematous from the mild, just air pocket in collating system. I think the urocellian barrier is very important. If the barrier is intact, I, I, I think it's, it just remove the, the obstructive stone and the, the good drainage, the infection will be controlled. If the class two or class three emphysematous pyonephritis invade to parenchyma, even just even over the kidney. I think IRS or PCL is not a good option. You maybe do some P multiple PCL drainage and the broad strain antibiotics after the, the infection was controlled, uh, patient will be so lucky. If the infection will not be controlled, I think nephrectomy is the uh, maybe not best. It's the only way to resolve, resolve the the, the, the complex condition of patients. Uh, I have one experience patient have an epistematous and the progression even uh, became the cutaneous and the kidney fistula. I think it's very uh, uh, severity. So uh, I'm so lucky because my patient just have a mild epistematous pyelonephritis and the, the mucosa barrier is intact. So I, 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 don't, I don't worry about the the, the uh, PCR uh, uh, the mm -hmm. fistula problems. So okay. I think it's Thank the you. different of severity. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Tai. Okay. Awesome. I'm very, uh, my name is Din Chen Jia. I'm from Changkeng Memorial Hospital. I'm very glad that this meeting in uh, this so many experts to share their experience with us in this wonderful afternoon. Uh, Dr. Sen tells us that nicotine, nicotine is a very, maybe a risky, very important risky factor in urolysis development. And uh, maybe uh, maybe later, I, it's an interesting agency. I've never seen about it. And Dr. Zhou introduced about uh, us the, some smart glass, a mini robotic system. And I think it might reduce the compact Economies of in operation room when we do our eyes, and maybe this is the future of the storm management later. And Dr. Fong tells us that preoperation plays a double J for uh, infectious obstructive neuropathy. I think it's good. So maybe well, otherwise uh, the patient and or maybe double J. There are some um, some people with different of view, but I think uh, Dr. Fong give a very good point. And Dr. Li and Dr. Tsai, Tsai give us a very precious and very risky case uh, to share with us. And Dr. Dr. Luying and uh, Dr. Zhang uh, give their experience about how to unblock resection the, the bladder tumor with uh, tulip laser instead of the bipolar or monopolar Resection as our traditional way, and with minimal, minimum, minimal risk. And the doctor, uh, Dr. Jeremy, give us nice how to perform the integration with bipolar instead of the olive or tulip. And this, I think, this 
very good experience to gain in this afternoon. Is there, if you not even have any question, I would like to give the microphone to my old friend, Dr. Zhou, the chairman of the AUSET. Dr. Thank Joe. You. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Lin. And just, I'm so happy to see you, all the speakers and moderators. And I really hope to see you in person. <laughs> and I, I'll try to uh, the, the visit the AUA or UA because I have to moderate some abstract sessions, sessions there. So uh, I hope to meet you uh, in the near future. Thank you for the organizing this wonderful event. My Taiwanese friends, you did a great job. Thank you. And we also want to introduce next month's uh, episode of ETS uh, Thailand team, Dr. Shunake. We will talk about his issue. Okay, may, I, may I share the slide just a moment? Yes, okay. Hey, you everybody can see their site, right? Um, right. Okay, I'm Chin Kei Gisman from Thailand. Firstly, I would like to congratulate Professor Li, Professor Shao for the successful this event. And thank you so much for giving the great opportunity to for me to promote the next event, all set that held in 26 March in Thailand. Uh, in next event, uh, it's a collaboration among three countries, including Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And we also have the guest speaker from England, Professor Richard Hindley. He will talk about the Lisum, Lisum mobilization. And Professor Pearl John Slot Oster from Denmark, he is expertise in trillium laser fiber. Moreover, you will enjoy the other interesting topic from a native post speaker such as mini PCNL, Supai PCNL, integration, and RIRS in Stackhorn Stone. Similar to this event, please register at our principal website, worldwideweb.endolumino.org. See you next month. See you. And thank you all for this afternoon attendance. And I see you next month. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 男子的是背板的用一次哎。<laughs> <laughs>